and talk a little bit about detection. I just want to give you a, a, the basics of how detection theory works by working through the simplest possible detection problem, the detection of a binary phase shift keyed signal. Because if you work through this problem, almost every other detection problem, whether it's tractable or not, behaves in a very similar manner. In fact, some of the formulas are almost identical with just a few constants changed. Okay, so here's our detection problem. I've got a signal, binary phase shift keying signal. I sent ones and zeros on some sort of pulse. I receive that signal that's on a carrier at my receiver. I mix it down to baseband or I mix it down to IF and digitize it, however you want to do things. I run it through a matched filter. So now I have, in time, every even interval, every sample period, every symbol period, I have an estimate of the amplitude of that signal. It's not a perfect estimate because along for the ride was all this thermal noise that we've talked about how to characterize. And that's going to create a disturbance. So I need to figure out how reliable can I actually figure out whether it was a 1 or a 0. And so, I have this binary phase shift keying signal. On my IQ diagram, BPSK is just two points. This is my one and this is my zero. If I align the, the constellation properly, I don't even need a Q axis. I just throw away the quadrature channel because I'm not using it. And if that's the case, all I need to do to make a decision is figure out, is my estimated point on the right hand or the left hand of this dotted line, the Q-axis? So I'm going to transmit this, but the actual point will be this plus noise. Plus noise. This is an example of an estimate out of the matched filter. Okay, so this is a voltage, voltage V. Of course, this would be negative V. And I sent either a plus or a minus V. Out of my matched filter, I receive that value plus Gaussian noise. And so to set my detection problem up formally, I want to figure out what is the probability that I can detect that properly? And so to do that, I define a quantity called bit error rate. And that's a very, kind of a poorly named odd thing because there's, there's no rate involved. It's really just a unitless percentage. It doesn't have units of something per second, which you would expect the rate to have. It basically says what percentage of bits that you send under these statistical situation conditions of Gaussian noise, in this case, what percentage of bits, what fraction of bits are going to be received correctly. Okay, so it's a probability problem. I got bit error rate, or BER, and to calculate that, I'm gonna, the, the probability that I have incorrectly decoded a signal is the probability that my signal Y is less than zero given that I started transmitting a positive V. Uh, but I've got to weight this, weight this, because I've got two different kind of errors that can happen. I can also make an error 
where I have detected y to be on the right-hand side of the quadrature axis, even though I sent minus v. I had enough Gaussian noise to disturb this point all the way past the decision boundary. And I have to weight these probabilistically because this is only going to happen insofar as I've actually sent a v. So I need the probability that I actually sent a positive v and the probability that I have sent a negative v to weight each of these conditions. Well, okay. Let's be real for a second. We know what the probability is that I sent a v or a minus v, right? What is it? If, this, if I've done anything right as a comm engineer and I'm sending real, rich, interesting data, what's, what's the prob probability? 0.5, right? There should be just as many ones as there are zeros in your data stream. Okay. So that's good. Secondly, this problem is symmetrical, right? If I look back at my diagram here, if I send this and I have the same bell-shaped curve, the Gaussian-shaped curve here, my probability of making an error is basically going to be the area under the bell-shaped curve to the left of the axis. If, however, I sent a signal here and I add my Gaussian noise, because the noise is symmetrical, the area is going to be, so these should be the same probabilities for my particular problem at hand. When I have additive white Gaussian noise, the kind that thermal noise is modeled as, this is how I do it. It's symmetrical. Not all communication systems are necessarily going to be symmetrical. There's asymmetrical noise. And so to calculate a bit error rate in that type of situation, you'll have to come back to your canonical first principles Go all the way back to Professor Durgan's lecture on bit error rate and start with his first expression and parse it out. But we don't have to do that. Now we're going to start making some simplifications. We already said there were the same number of ones and zeros. And now we're going to say that this is equal to this because of the symmetry issue of the constellation and the noise. So 0.5 times this, which is the same thing as this, times 0.5. If I just calculate the probability that y is less than 0, given I sent a positive v, I've characterized the bit error rate. Now, what's more, let's look at this problem. Really what I'm saying is, what is the probability that the noise that I added to this system is less than negative v? Because if I transmitted a positive V and the Gaussian noise is less than negative V, that's the only situation that when I add those two together, I push the decision to the back of the line. Okay, and this is actually a very easy, or at least a very easy setup to calculate the probability. What I need to do, I need the distribution, the PDF, if you'll all recall, of my normal random variable. Well, that's easy. You've worked problems with that before. Some of you may be able to pull it out of your head without even re remembering. Others may have to look in the professor's notes. Oh. I've used this a hundred times. <laughs> it's funny. I was working a problem with a Gaussian distribution just the other day. And like, after doing hundreds and hundreds of these problems and having this formula memorized for years, I was like, is there a Two, by the standard deviation inside the exponential, I can't remember. And I, I, for the life of me, I could not remember whether there was a two. It was just complete. I had my 40th birthday last year, so it's all over the hill from here on out. And I'm already starting to see, like, all these signs of my mind and my body breaking down. It's Professor Smith, he always said, Whatever you want to do, he would take me by the hand. He said, whatever you want to do, do it while you're young. So when you get old, you can't do anything. There's a chance you won't be able to do it. This is just a little very irresponsible advice to give a room full of 20-year-olds. So you'll see that the Gaussian does have, in fact, a 2 right there. And so 
when you have a PDF like this, how do you do it? Well, we just said it was the area under the curve, the part that goes from basically minus infinity to minus V, integration of this integral from minus infinity to V. Okay, let's go ahead and do a few things, change some things around. First of all, I'm going to flip this so that it's positive, so that it's positive. And I'm going to do a substitute this into here too so that we see what the final form of the integral is. going to be 1 over my standard deviation of noise. I'll use signal, sigma n to represent that. That's basically going to be, when I square it, that's going to be proportional to noise power. We're kind of doing everything in voltages here, though, because detection is based on voltages in a coherent receiver. So we went from minus infinity to minus v. I'm just going to make everything positive and go from, um, excuse me, from v to positive infinity. That means I have to flip the sign of my PDF, but it was squared in there anyway, so it doesn't matter. I can just leave it the same, EXP to the minus N squared. This is a symmetrical distribution, so if I flip the sign on N and square it, it doesn't matter. Okay, now, I'm going to do a little U substitution. U squared is equal to negative n squared over 2 sigma n squared. This helps me put it into a standard format when I do the change of variables so that I have 2 square root of pi, the integral. It changes the limits of integration here. I'm going to go to from, oops, from v to sigma n square root of 2. Infinity is still infinity. EXP minus U squared DU. Now, this does not have a nice transcendental function outcome. Again, we have to resort to a special function. You'll be happy to know it's not the Bessel function. First time a special function other than the Bessel function showed up in this class. Uh, there are actually two ways to, to express this result. This integral happens, has happened so many times um, in the natural sciences that we have our, our own set of functions to deal with it. And some people that do statistics a lot are as comfortable as working with those functions as they are sines and cosines. Now, which functions you use depends on whether you're a statistician or a mathematician or a physicist on one hand, or if you're an engineer. Right? There are two ways to, to write this integral. If you are an engineer, this integral is equal to the Q function of V over sigma. This is the most practical way to express this integral. We take the voltage, we divide it by the standard deviation of the noise, and we feed it into the Q function. I'll give you a sketch of the Q function in a second. Now, if you're a mathematician, you roll your eyes and you say, there, the, there goes those engineers again. First of all, they defined a definite integral with an infinite limit. We hate that. I've never been able to figure out why, but mathematicians hate that. And so what they really do is they rearrange things. They say, well, this is a probability density function, right? And so if I want the area under the curve starting at v over sigma sub n square root of 2, I know that if I integrate this entire area from here to infinity, that's going to be 1 half, right? So... Really, I'm going to take one-half minus uh, a special function of my own desire, design, 
that has finite limits in it. And so I am going to uh, recast this in this way. This, what is this called? Anybody remember from your classes? What special function is that? Yeah. Go ahead. The error function, of course. ERF. And you do V over sigma sub N divided by the square root of 2. Now, in fact, this shenanigan of subtracting the error function F of 1 half happens so much in the natural sciences just to avoid having an infinite limit, which is by no means wrong from a philosophical point of view, that <clears throat> they call this the complementary, ERFK. ERFK. All this to avoid this, which doesn't bother us engineers at all, this, this infinity. There you go. There you go. Okay, now the real question is, what does the Q function actually look like? That would be helpful to know here. And let me switch now to the overhead for a second because I have a plot of it. <clears throat> Turn it on. Focus it in over here. There we go. Good, 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 good. <clears throat> How's that looking? Okay, there's my Q function. And <clears throat> it's actually a pretty boring function. It's a monotonically decreasing function. It never bends back up on itself. Notice how I've plotted it, though. I have the argument in the linear scale, Q of 0, Q of 1, Q of 2, Q of 3, Q of 4. And on this axis, I have logarithmic. Q. Wow. So this thing really falls off the table, especially once you get past like Q of 2 or Q of 3. It just kind of arcs downward. So that your probabilities actually fall very, very, uh, fall off very quickly. You're down to like 10 to the minus 6 past Q as a function of the value 4. So keep in mind what our final expression was. We said that bit, I'll just write it here, bit error rate is equal to Q voltage over sigma sub n. Okay. So notice what happens. What's Q of 0? Everybody see that value? Can you read it off? The, it's 0.5. That means basically you have no signal power and some non-zero amount of noise. Q of zero is 0.5. You only get half the bits wrong. Why isn't it, why isn't it 100%? If you don't have a signal, if, you, if your noise is overwhelming, why don't you get 100% bit error rate? Yeah. Well, you're yeah, saying if you randomly guess, you're never going to do worse than 0.5, right? If you have a, a, a channel that has a 100% bit error rate, it's a perfect channel. You just, you're always being lied to. It's the paranoid, perfect paranoid's channel. As long as you just do the opposite of what everybody tells you, then you have perfect communications. And so that, that always throws people when they see that for the first time, but that's true. That's 0.5 up there. And then the probability falls off dramatically. Now, usually you use tables to tabulate that. Keep in mind that um, MATLAB or any software package will have an error function built into it. So you may have to take the complement manually and adjust the argument according to those formulas on the board. Um, or you can define your own Q function and, and do it. But there's always the, the, the error function and the Q function and the complementary error function are so common in statistics. Every mathematical package, even Excel, has that. To, and it evaluates very quickly. Um, now, there are some approximations you can make. For example, when the argument gets large, 
you can kind of use this approximation as the Q function. It looks like uh, a Gaussian, an EXB to the minus X squared over 2, but you have this extra X in the denominator killing the amplitude. But back to this curve here, now you can kind of see the beginnings of the, the, the hallmark of digital communications, really. The, this idea that signals do not gracefully degrade in a digital communications link. They go from great to bad very quickly. And this gets even more emphasized when we start adding some correction coding in a second. But we'll look, we'll look what I mean. When you are at V over sigma sub N of about 5, you're close to 10 to the minus 7 on this graph. You could send 10 million bits, and you're probably only going to get a few of them wrong at that point, according to this graph. That's pretty good. Now, you cut that same ratio in half, so now you're at 2.5. Your bit error rate is now down to, it uh, looks like to be about 7 times 10 to the negative 3 from this graph. So you send 1,000 bits, and seven of them are bogus. If you go down to here to one, you send 10 bits, and two of them are bogus. That's a very rapid degradation. It's not like the old analog channels where you could put information on an analog, on an analog carrier AM or FM, and you start adding noise, and it looks perfect at signal-to-noise ratios of 40 or 50 dB, but slowly it gets staticky, more and more staticky, more and more staticky, but over, you're still watchable. And then finally, towards the end, down about 20 dB, you can't even make out what's going on. 10 dB, forget it. Maybe just make out some rough images. It's, too, it's getting corrupted, unwatchable. This goes from great to bad in a short period of time. And it's going to get even worse in a second. But first, let me go back to the board and give you some finalizing formulas. A couple comments here. We've done, we derive this in terms of voltages. I got a standard deviation of noise power, of noise voltage signal, and actual signal voltage. If I want to put this in terms of, these are exactly proportional to, in their square, uh, to the square root of carrier to noise ratio. So we calculated uh, carrier to noise or signal to noise ratios um, earlier in the class. The, that's just the ratio of the signal power, which you calculate with a link budget, to your noise power, which you calculate with your KTB analysis that we talked about earlier. So we know as RF engineers how to calculate carrier to noise ratios. How does that translate to a signal-to-noise ratio? Here's a basic, simple formula. It's, of course, this is with respect to power, not voltage, so we've got to take the square root, and then there's this factor of 2 in that you have to put in. But basically, if you know what the RF signal power to noise power ratio is, multiply by 2, take the square root, and that is your argument to your Q function. So this is a handy formula to have. Now, some people, particularly communications theorists, don't use carrier-to-noise ratio or signal-to-noise ratio. Instead, they do a little bit of uh, massaging. Massaging. So if carrier-to-noise ratio... CNR is given by your signal power over your noise power, the ratio of those two powers in watts or milliwatts, however you're measuring them. Well, your signal power, 
is equal to the energy per bit. Let's define this quantity in units of joules. That's the total amount of energy per bit. For simple BAPSK signal, it's basically your symbol period times your power. Right? A bit lasts this long. There's this much average power in it. I multiply it to. I get a good estimate of my signal energy. And so if I divide this by the bit period, I get my signal period power. Now, when I go to look at the noise, remember we said that white noise was characterized by this noise PSD. It had units of watts per hertz or watt seconds or actually joules. And the, if, this is KT, if this is KTB, I multiply this by 2 times my bandwidth B, which is actually the inversely related to my bit period. So here's And naught is KT sys over 2 in our classical noise analysis. If I multiply that by 2B, which is really 2 over my bit period, then I get my noise power in the denominator. Why do I put this in this form? Um, Drop the two here. I think the bandwidth should be one over two TB in an ideal system. The reason is all this stuff cancels except for the energy per bit over N naught. So for BPSK, the carrier to noise ratio is equal to EB over N naught. Energy per bit over noise power spectral density, watts per hertz. So a lot of textbooks and papers that you'll read in communications will plot the bit error rate as a function of EB over N naught instead of carrier to noise ratio. It's good to learn how to map. You'll have to look up how to map EB over N naught to your specific type of signal that you're using that involves the bandwidth and uh, uh, the number of bits per symbol. But the reason why comm engineers like to do this is because it makes a lot of the curves independent of bandwidth. You say, oh, what is the energy per bit? What is the power spectral noise density? So when you start coding and adding redundancy, sometimes you're having to change the, the bits, uh, bit period, or add more um, if you're, if you're dithering with the rate, as long as you know what the energy per bit is of your signal, regardless of what the actual rate is, you'll get the right result with this formula. So it becomes independent of that physical parameter. Easier to calculate things like coding gain, which will make more sense in a second. So just be aware that when, now we have basically three formulas. If you know the electrical parameters in terms of voltage, you can calculate the bit error rate. I'm an RF engineer. I like this form. You can char characterize the carrier to noise ratio, which we know how to calculate in this class. You can use the Q function form of that. Or if you're a comm theoretician, you can use this form, EB over N naught. Now, any questions? Any questions so far? Okay, so we've worked through the simplest possible detection problem, that of binary phase shift keying. There are all these other complicated forms of modulation, but the behavior is very sim sim similar. Sometimes the solution isn't even analytic. You can't even come up with something involving a Q function, and you have to resort to simulation to figure out what the bit error rate curves are as a function of signal-to-noise ratio. Well, it turns out that the shape is very similar to a Q function in most of those cases. In fact, 
so much so that there are a lot of empirical approximations based on Q functions for all these complicated different types of modulation schemes. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. For QPSK, your bit error rate is the Q function of your carrier to noise ratio. So you lose the factor of two. You get to transmit more bits per symbol, but you lose a little bit of the inside the Q function. If you wanted to do coherent frequency shift keying, you open up your communications textbook, you look at the table of bit error rates, which are usually tabulated exhaustively for all the different modulation schemes. Coherent FSK is where you're just taking two frequencies and flipping back and forth between them. MSK is a minimum shift keying is a special case of that. If you want to figure out what the bit error rate for that formula is, bit error rate is, turns out to be the exactly the same. You know, with the carrier to noise ratio is, you know how many bits you're going to get in error in that, uh, in that type of modulation. Now, so for something more complicated, if you're transmitting MRE QAM, this was a, a more of an empirical formula. It's not an exact formula, but it works pretty well in pet practice. You take 4 times 1 minus the square root of M times Q function. 3 over M minus 1 C over N. And this becomes more accurate for large M. So, for example, let's say I'm transmitting M equals 4. 4 quam. That's actually the same as QPSK, right? 4 constellation points, where M is the number of constellation points. 1 over the square root of 4 is 1 over 2. 1 minus, that's 2. I get a 2 here. 3 divided by uh, 4 minus 1, that's 1. So basically, my formula puts a 2 in front of here and leaves this same. So it's not a very good approximation for that one. When you move up to 16 qualm, though, it actually starts to be a pretty good approximation. And you can see the, the additional constellations at work, uh, the constellation points at work. As I increase my M, M is in the denominator, so it's going to smash down my, the argument of my Q function. When I smash down the argument of my Q function, I'm going to get a much higher error rate. Well. What is that? What's going on there? Well, I'm putting more constellation points for the same carrier to noise ratio, for the same transmitted power. I'm packing them in. It's going to be harder to decode. It's going to be easier to add some error, vec error noise that pushes the signal to the, an adjacent constellation point region. I'm going to decode it improperly. And so this is a nice rule of thumb for any type of qualm modulation. If you've done a good job of spreading out your bits, it doesn't even have to be rectangular or in a square grid. If you've done a fairly good job of spreading out your points, this is a nice approximate expression for that. So hopefully you, know, you have enough knowledge now to jump into any specification, any textbook, any something. If somebody describes to you uh, a complicated signal constellation and modulation scheme, and then talks about the exhaustive simulations that they've done. They give you a graph, and you say, oh, yeah, it's, this is behaving exactly as it should. It's shaped kind of like a Q function falling off the edge in the logarithmic scale. Or they'll give you a formula that's based on the Q function. It's relatively easy to plug it in and figure out what the bit error rate is because it behaves very much like the BPSK network. Okay. Ah, uh, Yes. The simulation about the energy per yeah. we're using it instead of the signal, uh, instead of the power, because uh, we can suppress the 
vary it in the expression? Or? Yeah, so this is energy per bit. The reason why, um, so what we're going to do next is start to add redundant bits to our stream so that we can correct errors. That's actually possible. And when that happens, now there's some ambiguity. If you're in a radio link, you say, well, am I going to have to speed up? I have to double my bandwidth because I'm transmitting twice as many coded bits as I was data bits. But the energy per bit in that scenario has not changed, right? Is it, I, I have my, my individual coded bits now take up only half the time and have half the signal energy, but it takes two coded bits to make a data bit. And so the energy per data bit is the same. And so for that reason, I can go to an EB over N naught curve and, and read the value off for bit error, error rate. That's the reason why uh, telecom engineers prefer EB over N naught, whereas RF engineers like myself like to work in the physical quantities, power signal, power noise. And there's always a way to convert between these different expressions for a given modulation scheme. Yeah? So, uh, this, uh, the spec for this energy will be specified for the application instead of the power? That's right. That's right. Or you can convert the ratio. There's a conversion factor for each modulation scheme to go from SNR to EB over and not.